Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about pediatric asthma. First of all, what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic lung disease which is characterized by periods without symptoms and sudden difficulty in breathing due to inflammation and swelling of the airways together with the mucus formation and bronchoconstriction. This state is also known as status asthmaticus or asthma attack. Important to note is that this obstruction is reversible. An asthma attack is typically caused by a hyper-responsiveness of the bronchi to certain triggers, as cold air, exercise or even certain smells. Even though the definition of asthma is quite clear, it is still difficult to diagnose children of preschool age and infants. This is because up to half of all infants and children younger than three years will experience at least once in this time an episode of bronchoconstriction and wheezing. But 60% of children who had one of those episodes will be considered free of asthma at school age. Even though the definitive diagnosis is difficult, it is possible to identify high-risk children among the population of 2- and 3-year-olds. A child can be considered to be of high risk to develop asthma if he had 4 or more episodes of wheezing in one year, of which at least one episode was confirmed to be a true wheezing by a doctor plus either one major criteria or two minor criteria. The major criteria are having a parent with asthma, having atopic dermatitis or having a sensitivity to an aeroallergen. The minor criteria are having a food sensitivity, having a peripheral eosinophilia of at least 4%, and experiencing a wheezing that is not related to an infection. In the next part, I would like to talk about the different pediat pediatric asthma phenotypes. Asthma phenotypes help to differentiate the different causes and triggers that a child may experience. On the poster you can see a chart that is used to differentiate between virus-induced asthma, exercise-induced asthma, allergen-induced asthma, and unresolved asthma. The different phenotypes are differently common in the different pediatric age groups. In preschool children, so age 3 to 5, virus-induced asthma is the most common, followed by allergen-induced asthma, and then the least common, exercise-induced asthma. In school children, so age 6 to 12, allergen-induced asthma is the most common, followed by virus-induced asthma, and the least common is also in this group, the exercise-induced asthma. In adolescents, so the 12 to 18-year-old children, the phenotypes are equally likely as for school children. So allergen-induced asthma is the most common form, and exercise-induced asthma is the least common form. Now I would like to talk a little bit more about the different phenotypes. Allergen-induced asthma is, as we said, more common in school-age children than in younger children. Usually an allergen can be identified with close observation and there is a clear clinical correlation between exposure and symptoms. Exercise-induced asthma is not exclusive for, but typical for young children, aged 3 to 5 years. It is often an isolated exercise-induced asthma, which means that the clinical signs and symptoms are observed during moderate to strenuous exercise for that age group, and a child is free of symptoms for extended periods when not doing those kind of exercises. It is possible for this type of asthma to be exacerbated by viral infections of the upper respiratory tract, 
which usually have a peak occurrence in the colder months of the year. The severity of the symptoms depend on the mode of exercise. So if the patient is, for example, walking or sporting on a bicycle or swimming. It also depends on the environmental conditions and if the airways are already in a worse condition by infections, medications and possible concomitant chronic respiratory diseases. All those factors influence the level of ventilation of the airways as well as the heat production and water loss in the airways and the heating of the inflowing air through the mouth and nose in a higher respiratory rate. A reduction of the outside temperature and humidity can precipitate a severe bronchoconstriction and so can bring on a status asthmaticus. In the next point I would like to talk about the diagnosis of asthma in a pediatric patient. Asthma should always be suspected in a child who has recurrent episodes of wheezing or coughing. For the establishment of a diagnosis, it is usually necessary to perform a long-term follow-up as well as to observe the response of a child to bronchodilating medications and or anti-inflammatory medications. To diagnose a child with asthma, we can remember the three R's. Those are reactivity, reversibility and reoccurrence. Reactivity means that there should be an identifiable trigger, usually a viral infection, but it can also be an allergen in the air or exercise. Reactivity means that by the usage of bronchodilating medications, the airway obstruction resolves and the status asthmaticus passes. Reoccurrence means that a child has experienced at least three episodes in the previous year. In the obtaining of a medical anamnesis of a child that we suspect to have asthma, we should always ask about recurrent episodes of wheezing and or coughing. We also have to ask the parents if they suspect a specific trigger as exposure to passive smoking, cold air, pets, exercise or certain smells. A child might also experience a change in the sleep pattern as frequent waking up during the night, waking up coughing or experiencing sleep apnea. It is also important to note the number of exacerbations in the past year, as well as if the patient experiences any nasal symptoms, as a runny nose, sneezing or itching, for example. Children might also avoid exercise or to take part in sport classes and might have trouble concentrating. Some patients also have signs of allergies, indicating the atopic type of asthma that usually also presents with higher levels of eosinophils. The patient might have an atopic eczema or dermatitis, dry skin, irritating conjunctiva of the eyes and other identified allergies as hay fever, allergy, allergy to pet hair or others. In the next point I would like to talk about the different severities of asthma. This is usually staged by the severity of the acute episode. In a mild episode, the patient usually experiences an increase in the respiratory rate, however the oxygen saturation of the blood remains over 95%. In a moderately severe episode, the respiratory rate as well as the heart rate increase. The heart rate is usually at around 100 to 120 beats per minute. Also the accessory muscles of respiration are used and a loud expiratory wheezing can be heard even without the use of a stethoscope. The oxygen saturation of the blood drops slightly to usually 91 to 95 percent. In a severe episode the respiratory rate increases even more to usually around 30 to 60 beats the breaths per minute in older children and even higher in smaller children as they typically have a physiologically higher respiratory rate. 
Also, the heart rate is typically higher than 120 beats per minute and a loud biphasic wheezing can be heard. This means that there will be abnormal breathing sounds in inspiration and expiration. The oxygen saturation of the blood is generally less than 90%. It is also possible to determine the degree of obstruction of the airways with a pulmonary function assessment. Here a patient has to breathe forcefully into a device which measures the volume of air that is expired from the lungs in one second. This is abbreviated as FEV 1%. The FEV 1%, so forced expiratory volume in one second, is said to be decreased if it is less than 80% of the predicted volume of air. A FEV1 of 60 to 79% of the predicted value indicates a mild obstruction. A FEV1 of 40 to 59% of the predicted value indicates a moderate obstruction. And a FEV1 of less than 40% of the predicted value indicates a severe obstruction. This value changes after the use of bronchodilating medication and is so used in the diagnosis and differentiation of asthma to other diseases. Other possible differential diagnoses to bronchial asthma include a foreign body that might be stuck in the airways causing a wheezing sound, allergic rhinitis which also leads to airway obstruction, aspergillosis which is a fungal infection of the airways, aspiration syndromes, bronchiectasis, bronchiolitis, cystic fibrosis, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and many more. The differential diagnoses are quite broad, which makes it even more important to assess the patient carefully and thoroughly. The therapy of asthma is divided into different steps according to the severity of the disease. Generally, two types of medications are used. The first is the type called asthma relievers. They are used in the case of an exacerbation or asthma attack to relieve the sudden onset of symptoms. The other type is the asthma controllers, which are used every day regardless of exacerbations to prevent another asthma attack. In the group of reliever medications are rapid-acting inhaled beta-2 agonists, systemic glucocorticosteroids, anticholinergics, theophylline, and short-acting oral beta-2 agonists. In the group of controller medications are inhaled glucocorticosteroids, leukotriene modifiers, long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonists in combination with inhaled glucocorticosteroids, systemic glu glucocorticosteroids, theophylline and anti-immunoglobulin E's. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much.